Welcome everyone to 1916. This is our third episode looking at World War I from start to finish. And we are using uh, as our discussion starter uh, the fantastic series from Epic History TV on the Great War. Link is in the description to the original video if you want to watch it without my commentary, without my discussion, uh, as well as the link to 1914. So you can go back and watch this uh, series from the beginning. I want to thank you guys so much. You came through above and beyond my expectations. I asked you yesterday during the 1915 video to please hit that like button and to please leave a comment. And boy, did you guys do that. Our comment rate and our like rate were way, way up on that video. If you could please keep that going with every video, I would be grateful. And that is going to help reach a lot of new people. Uh, I love this community. I love all of the great feedback. And so I'm going to ask you to do the same thing today. If you like this video, please hit that like button and, and please leave a comment. Either let me know something that we didn't talk about in this video or let me know something you learned from this video, either from something I said or something from the video itself, something you may not have known about what happened in these events of 1916. Let's go ahead and dive into part three. World War I was supposed to have been a short and glorious war. But by 1916, a new kind of industrialized warfare had seen the death toll soar into the millions, with no end in sight. So you hear that term, industrialized warfare. Uh, and really, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to define that. But basically, this is the first war where you see on a massive scale uh, the industries of these various countries just going into overdrive in producing war materials. So with the upcoming uh, Battle of Verdun, which we're going to see here uh, in 1916, I'm sure it'll be one of the first events because it started in February 1916, one of the bloodiest battles in all of human history. You have the Germans stockpiling 2 million artillery shells just for the start of that battle and that battle did not take place we're not talking about a hundred mile long front we're talking about a very small area around one major city in france two million artillery shells i believe a million were fired on the first day that's what industrialized warfare looks like at some point we're going to take a look at our friend indy nidell who did a video on the great war channel about uh, the supplies and what it took just to keep one small section of the Canadian front going from day to day. The food, the ammunition, the supplies, the water, the gasoline, all of those different things that it took for one tiny section of the front. And then you multiply that times millions on either side. That's industrialized warfare. Naval blockades were beginning to cause shortages of food and fuel across Europe. While thousands of women had entered the workforce, replacing the men sent to fight in their millions. And that's something else that's fairly new. And you know, a lot of these things that you're hearing, like industrialized warfare, women in the workplace, since our collective minds are so focused on World War II because of the culture and the media and the movies and the TV shows. And there's been so much focus on World War II. Plus, we still have some World War II veterans still with us. Uh, a lot of these are things that we associate with World War II, but really World War I is where we see them on a, on a massive scale for the first time. All sides were preparing for a long war. The war has raged for a year and a half as the Allies continue to battle the Central Powers, recently joined by Bulgaria. At sea, the British maintain their naval blockade of Germany, preventing the import of food and other vital raw materials. Germany has retaliated with a U-boat blockade of Britain, but has to limit its attacks to avoid provoking the neutral USA, whose citizens have already been caught in the crossfire. So this is one of the first times in the war where you really see 
uh, the pressure from outside, from a neutral nation, having an impact. Germany backs off of its unrestricted submarine warfare, at least for now. Uh, but part of the reason why I think they were willing to do that is because they know that they're about to launch this major offensive uh, and, and they've got a strategy to try and win the war in 1916. On the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in opposite the Germans. Both sides trapped in the bloody stalemate of trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Russians have ended their long retreat and stabilised the line. But their army has suffered huge losses. On the Italian Front, Italian troops have launched a series of costly, unsuccessful attacks against strong Austro-Hungarian defences. And this is the one place where Austria-Hungary kind of holds its own, is against the Italians. And, and I, don't know, I don't know enough about the Italian army to be able to say whether it's because of the skill level of the leadership with the Italians or if it's just the nature of the terrain because this goes on, a lot of this fighting is mountain fighting. Um, maybe somebody can answer that who's more familiar with the Italian front than I am. While on the Balkan front, the Central Powers have overrun Serbia, whose army is forced to make a bitter retreat through the Albanian mountains. Now, on the 5th of January, Austro-Hungarian troops attack Montenegro. They are delayed at the Battle of Mojkovac, but three weeks later, Montenegro is forced to surrender. On the Caucasus front, the Russians launch a surprise winter offensive against Ottoman Turkish forces. Six weeks later, Russian troops occupy the city of Erzurum. In April, they capture the Black Sea port of Trebizond. Meanwhile, the British transport two motorboats to Lake Tanganyika in Africa. They finally arrive after a 10,000 mile trip by sea and land. Um, imagine the amount of logistics involved in just sending two boats, two motorboats, that then you load up on land. But they make a difference, they really do. And help the British seize control of the strategic lake from local German forces. The same month in German Cameroon, German troops besieged on Mora Mountain for 18 months finally surrender to the Allies. 18 months. It marks the end of the Cameroon campaign. On the Western Front, the Germans unleash a devastating assault on the French fortress town of Verdun. German General Erich von Falkenhayn knows France will defend this symbolic town to the last man. His plan, in his own words, is to bleed France white in its defense. There's a lot of debate that goes on, even to this day, about exactly what Germany's intentions were with Verdun. That was the, the, the company line, so to speak, from the Germans, was uh, it really wasn't about like gaining ground, it was about forcing France to attack. Because remember, cult of the offensive. France, even at this point in the war, most of the higher ups, with the exception of a guy named Patan, who's gonna play much of a factor later on, much of the higher ups are still all about attack, attack, attack. And so the argument is Falkenhayn is saying, we're gonna take Verdun, because Verdun is this heavily fortified, really important city that France can't publicly afford to give up. And, and that was true because you have the French uh, leadership saying, under no circumstances can we let them keep Verdun. We have to have Verdun, no matter how many casualties it takes. And that's what the Germans say they're counting on. But not everybody agrees. And some people say that that's really kind of a hindsight argument for the Germans was the whole bleed uh, the French army white. Uh, but it does end up happening on both sides. Uh, what's crazy about it is that this, the major fort there, Fort Douaumont, which we'll be visiting on my trip here in a couple of weeks, um, is basically undefended, and a small group of Germans just walk into the fort 
when they take it. It's up on a high area. It's the most heavily fortified one. It does have one big artillery piece, but for the most part, it's empty. Uh, but boy, Verdun is just, I mean, when you think of the horrors of World War I, the events that take place in the spring and summer of 1916 kind of, in my mind at least, define that. Verdun and the Somme. It is the strategy of attrition. Verdun becomes one of the most terrifying battles of the war. A mincing machine, where infantry divisions are destroyed almost as fast as they can be fed into the line. Yeah, this is, it's kind of a change in strategy from traditional warfare. Uh, the idea here is not to take ground, not to take Paris, not to break through the line. It's how many of the enemy can we kill? so that he can't hold up against us anymore. It's, it's a shift in, in thinking. Um, Verdun is just, I mean, uh, one area of the battlefield is called the field of execution. I mean, that tells you what you need to know about this. Uh, artillery barrage is being heard as far as 100 miles away. Uh, you know, like I said, a million shells fired in a single day on a very small area. You go there to this day and the area of Verdun is uninhabitable because of how much devastation was done there. The, the number, the thousands, maybe tens of thousands of unexploded artillery rounds that are still in the soil there. It's, it's brutal. In Britain, one million men have already volunteered for military service. But the government realizes it won't be enough. Britain becomes the last major power to introduce conscription. That spring on the Western Front, British troops are the last to be issued with steel helmets. The nature of trench warfare produces a high proportion of head wounds. The German Stahlhelm, the French Adrian helmet, and the British Mark I steel helmet offer limited protection from shell splinters and shrapnel. Yeah, these are never intended to protect you against a bullet to the head, okay? The bullet's going to go right through it. These are to protect you against kind of indirect fire. You know, a shell explodes overhead and shoots shrapnel down on you, and hopefully maybe it deflects some of that. A shell hits a, a tree and sends splinters going everywhere. It protects you against that. Somebody throws a grenade that explodes on the ground above your trench. Those are the kinds of wounds it's there to protect. Neutral Portugal has been cooperating with the British, which seems to offer the best chance of holding on to her African colony, Portuguese Angola. On the 9th of March, Germany retaliates by declaring war on Portugal. On the Eastern Front, Russia launches an attack near Lake Narok to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun. Can, can I observe here too, and we're going to talk a lot about this when I go to France because I'm going to use a lot of these photos. World War I is incredible for many reasons, but one of them is that we actually have not only photos, but actual video of combat. You saw that photo earlier of the French soldier being killed at Verdun. Uh, we have video like from the Somme. I'm going to go to the spot um, where the Hawthorne Ridge crater exploded. And there's a, rec there's a video of that explosion happening. There's video of the men charging across the field and you see some of them start to go down as they're hit. It's really incredible stuff. But it's a disaster. There are 100,000 Russian casualties and the attack fails to divert any German troops from the fighting at Verdun. In Dublin, Irish Republicans launch an armed revolt against British rule. It becomes known as the Easter Rising. And there's a there's a movie about this that's really, really good. I think, um, I'm trying to think. I want to say, uh, let me take a look at it. So there's actually a few of them. This is one of them. This one's called Rebellion. It's a TV series on Netflix uh, about the Easter Rising. Uh, but that's actually not the one I'm thinking of. I think the one I'm thinking of... Uh, is actually um, Michael Collins. Uh, yeah, that's the one that has Liam Neeson, Aidan Quinn, Alan Rickman, Julia Roberts. Uh, it's really, really good and well done. And if you want to learn more about uh, the Easter Rising and the aftermath of it, that's a good place to start, I think. And is put down after six days of street fighting.
In the Middle East, after a five-month siege, British forces at Kut surrender. General Townsend leads 9,000 British and Indian soldiers into captivity. About half later die from starvation or disease. Pretty common on Britain both sides. Britain wants Arab support in its fight against the Ottoman Empire. So it's promised Arab leaders an independent Arab state after the war. But now, Britain and France secretly sign the Sykes-Picot Agreement, planning after the war to divide the Middle East into British and French zones of control. That's why I crossed my fingers. Yeah, we'll give you an independent state after the war. Now, secretly, we're going to we're gonna divide it up into French and, and British zones, kind of like what is done in World War II with, the, with Germany, the way it's partitioned. And this is where you're going to get Syria. It comes under the French zone, part of Turkey as well. Uh, Jordan is in there. Uh, and then you've got Iraq and Kuwait and a little bit of what is now Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, of course, uh, Israel slash Palestine is going to be right there. Unaware of this deal, Hussein bin Ali, Sharif of Mecca, leads the Arabs in revolt against Turkish Ottoman rule. In the Battle of Mecca, his forces seize control of the Holy City. On the Italian front, Austro-Hungarian forces launch a surprise attack at Asiago. Italian defences give way. Hey, at least for once we get a battle somewhere other than Isonzo, which is where most of the fighting takes place on the Italian front. Austro-Hungarian troops are poised to break through into northern Italy. That month in the North Sea, the German High Seas Fleet clashes with the British Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. In the only major naval battle of the war, the British suffer heavier losses but claim victory as the German fleet withdraws and does not re-emerge from its base for the rest of the war. Yeah, so I mean, uh, lot, you know, a lot of sinkings on both sides, but it has the effect of basically parking the German fleet. So it, it does the job. Uh, and, and at the very end of the war, you're going to have this uh, order given to the German fleet to kind of go on this suicide mission with the fleet to take it out uh, for one big showdown at the end, but they mutiny and they're like, forget that, we're not doing it. Uh, among other people, one of the officers aboard one of the ships at the Battle of Jutland is the future King George VI. For the summer of 1916, the Allies have planned major, simultaneous offensives against the Central Powers, from East and West. Now they are needed more than ever to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun and the Italians at Asiago. And why is this important? Because if you've got an enemy in Germany that's got a hold on multiple fronts, you need to keep up the pressure on those multiple fronts. So they're not bouncing troops back and forth from one place to another. This is something that Ulysses S. Grant understood in the American Civil War. Uh, because, for example, after the Battle of Gettysburg, you have Robert E. Lee uh, sending James Longstreet with a few of his divisions west to go fight uh, in the Western Theater, and they end up fighting at Chickamauga two months after they fought at Gettysburg. Uh, Grant put the pressure up by moving all the Union armies simultaneously in 1864, so the Confederates couldn't bounce units back and forth anymore because they were outnumbered, and, and they, they kind of had to do that. The Russians launched their attack first. On the Eastern Front, General Alexei Brusilov has carefully maintained the element of surprise. His troops break through the enemy lines, in some places advancing 60 miles and taking 200,000 prisoners. So Brusilov Offensive is important because this is when, this is really one of the first times that the Russian army pushes back. You know, they've been fighting and falling back, fighting and falling back. Now they're going on the offensive. Now they're taking it to the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans who are helping defend that area. Uh, and they gain some ground. But and again, you see those large numbers of prisoners being taken. Where are you parking them all? Because it's not like massive exchanges are going on. You know, if the Germans take 100,000 of yours and you take 100,000 of theirs, it's not like you swap them and give them back. They're just adding more and more prisoners. 
This brilliant, though costly, Russian attack achieves its aim, as the Central Powers are forced to redeploy troops from other fronts to shore up the line. At sea, British cruiser HMS Hampshire, en route to Russia, hits a mine and sinks off Orkney. Among the 650 dead is Britain's iconic Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener. Three days later in the Adriatic, Italian troop ship Principe Umberto is sunk by a German submarine. It's the deadliest sinking of the war with 1,900 lives lost. On the Western Front, Britain and France launch their major summer offensive, the Battle of the Somme. Hopes are high for a breakthrough, but the first day is a disaster. A long Allied artillery bombardment fails to knock out German defences, and waves of British infantry are cut down by machine gun fire. The Somme is one of those places, Verdun too, but the Somme, I don't know why I find myself, maybe it's because it's the British, and so maybe I connect with them a little more culturally because they speak English and those sorts of things, but um, it's just one of those places that, on one hand, I'm really looking forward to going to, but on another, um, I've had a number of people tell me that the World War I battlefields in general just... Uh, there's a real oppressive sadness that you feel when you're there, and I totally get that, and I know that I'm going to experience that myself. Um, so one part of me is really looking forward to being there, but another part of me has a little bit of kind of trepidation because I know what it's going to feel like, but the psalm is just, oh. Um, there's a, there's a, a beautiful docudrama that was done that you can uh, see. Go to YouTube and just look for the psalm. I'm sure it'll come up. It does a great job of mixing in information with also like acting to show you what's happening. Um, it's really well done, uh, put together beautifully, and I think does a great job of telling the story. Um, you know, they explode, I think, like 17 mines. They've dug all these mines under the German lines. And they're all supposed to go off like two to three minutes before the, the men go up and over the top to attack. Uh, but like they said, the artillery hasn't done its job. Uh, in places like the Hawthorne Ridge Crater where the Germans are up really high, the artillery can't even really hit them properly. Uh, but the, the crater explodes, but the Germans kind of settle in and, and are prepared. They've been hiding underground. And when the shelling stops and the, and the mines go off, they know the attack's coming. So that's when they come out. And the, the, the British lose, I think, 19,000 killed that first day at the Somme on, on like a 20-mile front. Uh, and they were supposed to... What's crazy about this is that because they were so sure that their artillery and the mines had done their job... They kind of walked across no man's land. They didn't, you know, go running and charging as fast as they could. They walked and they were loaded down with like 60 pounds of equipment. They carried their food and their supplies and, and guys had mirrors on their backs so that they could be seen from far away because they had these creeping barrage that was going on to lead, lead them and they needed to be able to see from the trenches where the lines were. And, they weren't supposed to take just that first trench. They were supposed to take the first trench. And then they had a certain time limit where there'd be another artillery barrage. And then they had to move out to take the second one and then move out to take a third one. A lot of them got the first trench, but it took longer than expected. And so their artillery barrage, their creeping barrage, it was supposed to lead them. A creeping barrage is... Uh, it was something that was developed during the war. It wasn't first used during the war. I think it was first used in the Balkans, but it was used heavily in World War I. Um, it would go just ahead of the infantry so that it would give you cover because the guys that are being hit have to keep their heads down and they can't stay out with their guns and, their, and, and position to fire. And so the idea is that it gives you cover until you can hit their trenches without having to suffer that kind of crossed machine gun fire. Well, it doesn't happen at the Somme. And these guys are walking across the field and they just get mowed down in massive numbers. It, it's so sad and so just brutal, but it's the way things went. They advance into no man's land. In the space of a few hours, 
the British suffer 57,000 casualties, a third of them killed. It's the worst day in the history of the British Army. One of the people who's fighting at the Somme is a young J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings. And uh, at least in part, he was inspired by what was happening at Verdun, which is, you know, just on the right flank of Verdun, or of the Somme, down, you know, um, a couple hour drive. Um, but the, the phrase that the French used was, il ne passera pas, which is, they shall not pass. And if that sounds familiar, it's very similar to the words that Gandalf uses in the Fellowship of the Ring when he when he's facing off against the Balrog and he puts his thing down and, and in the movie it, he, he puts down his staff and he says, "You shall not pass." Probably where Tolkien got that from. But more attacks are ordered, and the battle will rage for another five months. Last major entry to the war until the U.S. Encouraged by the Russian advance, Romania joins the Allies. But despite an initially successful advance into Transylvania, Romania quickly faces a counter-offensive from German, Bulgarian and Austro-Hungarian forces. The Allied force at Salonika tries to support Romania by launching their own offensive towards Monastir. So, you know, you might think on the surface that countries like Bulgaria and Romania joining the war, they're small, not a massive army. Are they really making much of a difference? But think about if things had gone differently. You know, we see Bulgaria enter the war on the side of the Central Powers, and that's when Serbia finally collapses. Uh, so imagine if they stay out or if they join the Allies. Romania, imagine if they join the Central Powers. Instead of there being additional uh, forces needed by the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans to defend against that front, now you've got additional forces to put pressure on the Russians and they probably collapse sooner. So you can see how just these, even these smaller countries like Romania and Bulgaria, who they join and when, it does matter. With Serbian troops in the lead, there are small gains, but dogged Bulgarian resistance prevents a breakthrough. On the Western Front, General von Falkenhayn finally calls off the attack at Verdun. And he's done. The French army has honored their commander, General Nivelle's promise. Ils ne passeront pas. They shall not pass. But victory comes at a terrible price. And I've heard it read uh, said that way usually, but as you see there, it says, on ne passe pas. Uh, which I don't know exactly how that translate different, translates differently than Il ne passeron Paul, but that's usually how I, I've heard it done. But this is kind of the end for Falkenhayn when this uh, Verdun doesn't work. 365,000 casualties. The Germans lose almost as many. 700. Verdun 000. remains one of the bloodiest battles in human history. And, I mean, you can see the skulls there, and it's kind of horrifying to look at, but that is the reminder of the, of the toll here. And, and one of the places we're going to visit is the Duelmont Ossuary in France, uh, where they have the bones, the German and French bones, of 100,000 men just thrown into these rooms. Because you have to remember, it's not like you can... Uh, recover your friends and give them a proper burial. A lot of these guys die out in the middle of no man's land during an attack. Places where artillery shells are falling, places where there's mud, and, and places that are in the middle of an area where if you went out to try and get to them, you'd be killed yourself. So some of these bodies are never given a burial at all. They, they decay right where they are. They're hit by artillery and they end up being buried. And, and, and so, I mean, there's no real way to identify uh, who they are. And so a lot of them just get mixed in together. And it's uh, just one of the stark reminders of the, of the scale of this war. For his defeat at Verdun, Falkenhayn is sacked, and Germany's heroes of the Eastern Front, von yep. Hindenburg and Ludendorff, take command in the West. Meanwhile, the Battle of the Somme continues. Near the village of Flair, the British introduce a new weapon they hope can break the deadlock of the trenches. Tanks. It is called the tank. But and it's called a tank because their initial prototypes, they looked like large water tanks. 
And so that was kind of why they came up with that name. The Germans only made like 20. They did occasionally capture Allied tanks that they would use. Uh, but for the most part, the tank is an Allied thing. They're the ones that produce them in large numbers. This is where George Patton's going to make his name for the first time uh, as kind of the real, the first real tank commander for the Americans. Uh, and we are going to visit this spot where in September of 1916, the first major tank attack takes place. We're also going to visit the place where, I forget the name, but I've got it in my notes, where the first tank battle takes place between tanks on both sides. Despite some small successes, the first tanks are too few in number and too prone to mechanical failure to make any real impact. Very unreliable. On the Eastern Front, Russia's Brusilov offensive comes to an end. Casualty estimates vary wildly, but it's clear both sides have suffered catastrophic losses. Neither the Russian nor the Austro-Hungarian army ever fully recovers. We just throw around these numbers. Think about this, 700,000 at Verdun, probably an equal number or more at the Somme, 2.4 million in the Brusilov offensive. After a while, you just kind of get numb to the numbers, but they add up really quickly. On the Italian front, heavy fighting rages throughout Sanzo the again. Autumn. As Eighth Italian battle. forces make repeated, costly Ninth. assaults against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River. The Battle of the Somme comes to an end amid autumn rain and mud. The Allies have advanced 10 miles at the cost of 600,000 casualties. German losses are about 450,000. So a million at the Somme. The Allies reassure themselves that this is a winning strategy. Because so I think that looks like King George V right there. I think we saw that picture before. At this rate, Germany will run out of men first. Meanwhile, disaster engulfs Romania as the country is overrun by the Central Powers. Romanian forces suffer a quarter of a million casualties remnants of its army take position alongside the Russians on the Eastern Front. That winter, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria since 1848, dies. He is succeeded by his son, Karl. I don't think that's his son. I think that's a mistake. Franz Joseph's son took his own life a few decades earlier. That's why uh, Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne. He was Franz Joseph's nephew. I think this is Franz Ferdinand's younger brother. Let's look that up. Yeah, so uh, Karl is actually the grand nephew of Franz Joseph. Uh, he's born in 1887. He's actually beatified by the Catholic Church. I'm not entirely sure why that is. He was beatified by Pope John Paul II in October of 2004. He is known in the Catholic Church as Blessed Karl of Austria. He died just a few years after he was forced to abdicate. He uh, died in 1922. Not entirely sure why he died when he did. Let's take a look at that. He was exiled to Madeira in Portugal. Um, he caught cold in town, which developed into bronchitis and then severe pneumonia. He had two heart attacks and then died of respiratory uh, failure in the presence of his wife, who was pregnant with, her eighth, with their eighth child, and the nine-year-old former crown prince Otto, who would have been then the next person to inherit the throne. Otto von Habsburg uh, serves as a member of the European Parliament for Germany. He's the head of the House of Habsburg until 2007. So this is the heir. I mean, think about this. This guy died in 2011 at the age of 98. And he was the son of the guy who was the Kaiser in Austria at the end of World War, II, World War I. Just incredible how close to modern times the, the family ties of World War I come. That's, that's really cool. So yeah, it's Britain, his grand nephew. Prime Minister Herbert Asquith is forced from office and succeeded by David Lloyd George. 
while General Joffre is replaced as French commander-in-chief by General Nivelle, who promises victory. So heads are rolling. Falkenhayn is, uh, I mean, think about all these changes. We have the bloodiest battles of the war taking place, massive casualties. You have Falkenhayn being replaced by the Germans. You have Joffre replaced by the French. You have a new prime minister in the UK. The UK has also just lost their minister for war, who was killed in that explosion on the ship. Uh, so you've got a lot of, oh, and the the Emperor of Austria dies. So major changes happening right at the midpoint of the war. Through bold, aggressive action. Amid the comings and goings, US President Woodrow Wilson's attempts to mediate a peace settlement come to nothing. Oh, go watch a clan movie. Side is willing to make concessions. Sorry, I don't like him. All right, so that is it. We're going to get into 1917. Uh, in the next episode, that'll be tomorrow. Uh, U.S. is going to enter the war in April, though not making a huge, significant contribution until 1918. There are Americans fighting in 1916, and we're going to do a story, uh, among others, uh, about the Lafayette Escadrille, which is, uh, if you've seen the movie Flyboys, kind of a fictionalized, ver fictionalized version of that. But it was a real-life group. It was a squadron, a French squadron, of volunteer American pilots uh, who wore French uniforms, flew French planes, were in the French army, uh, but were Americans. And there were Americans fighting on the ground as well in things like the Foreign Legion. Uh, so, in fact, the very first American to ever be killed in aerial combat in American history is a guy who starts out as a soldier on the ground in the, in the Foreign Legion and then switches over uh, to fight in the Lafayette Escadrille. And we're going to talk about uh, his story when we visit his grave over there. So let me know your thoughts. Did you learn something? If so, what was it? Or do you have something to add that you would like to share with all of us that was not talked about? Please hit that like button. And uh, as always, thank you so much for watching and for being a part of this community. Thanks.